Okay, so um, let me start off by introducing myself. I am Eileen Thrower and I am the department chair for the Department of Midwifery and Women's Health here at Frontier Nursing University. And I am joined by a few of my um, colleagues. Eva, would you like to introduce yourself? Yep. Hi, I'm Eva Freed. I'm the clinical director. As we unpack this um, slide deck, you'll probably learn a little bit more about how our roles are different. And you're welcome to ask questions. Um, many of us who are here will be responding to your questions in the chat in real time. So you can ask them. Don't worry about if it's coming up now or later. Um, yeah, that's me. Okay, great. Thanks. And um, Katie, would you introduce yourself? Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, my name is Katie Graves, and I am one of the clinical advisors. Um, I work in the clinical outreach and placement department, and um, we help students who are struggling to find clinical sites and preceptors. So we find ways to market yourself and help support you in that way. All right, great. Thank you, Katie. Um, and we'd love for anybody that um, if feels inclined to turn your cameras on, we'd love to see your face. So thanks for doing that if you're interested in that. Um, all right, we some of it, so we may be joined by a few more people as we move along. But anyway, so let us, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And as, um, as Eva said, I think as we're moving forward, I think you'll start to understand a little bit more about each of our roles at Frontier and hopefully we can answer whatever questions you all have. Um, so I'm gonna start off first with, this slide that has um, a very common a picture that's very common around Frontier, and that's us circling up at the end of one of our on-campus sessions. Um, we always spend a lot of time um, when we're together reflecting on our time together and what we've learned and what um, how we're going to apply it. And so this is kind of an example of that. But on the slide is our mission at Frontier, and I think it's important to start there because. At Frontier, everything we do is really guided by this mission. And so you can see um, some important concepts in here. Um, first of all, we're very committed to um, providing education for nurse midwifery and nurse practitioner students that um, focuses on um, incorporating principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also have a really specific focus in making healthcare leaders um, that are not only ethical, compassionate, innovative, all the things you see there, but we have that emphasis on rural and underserved communities. Um, certainly not all of our students live in rural or underserved communities, but that is our focus and that's um, really a guiding principle for us. So I'm hoping as we move through the slides that some of this resonates with you. If so, I think you'll um, hopefully begin to feel like, well, maybe I'm in the right place. So let me um, just give you a little bit of other information generally about Frontier. This is really the high level 30,000 foot view now. Um, one of the most important things I believe um, about Frontier that I think our students and our staff and our faculty experience, we're all very committed to a culture of caring. So um, this is different, I think, than a lot of places I've personally been in my life where I've entered some education programs where you feel more like, um, you know, some of the goal is to weed out the people that shouldn't be there or other things, but that is not us at Frontier. At Frontier, um, we are really committed to a culture of caring, which, commit, which includes um, supporting each other um, and helping all of our students as they move through their journey towards becoming nurse midwives or nurse practitioners. Um, so I think it makes a really important difference in the student experience at Frontier. Um, of course, you may already know that Frontier is a fully um, online distance education program. Um, so basically, the good news there is you end up using your own um, home as your classroom. So, you know, lots of folks will do that in a spare bedroom or at the dining room table or a corner of the living room, however that works for you. But it, um, but we really want you to um, understand that the way we really, what we really value at Frontier is for you to stay in your community, do your learning there. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but there are two times that travel to campus is required and that's in um, Lex, outside of Lexington, Kentucky, in uh, the town called Versailles, which is really near the air airport there in Lexington. But most of your learning takes place where you are in your community, and then you work 
uh, with our team and Katie, for instance, folks like Katie and Eva to help find clinical sites in your communities so that really, even though we're all spread out all over the country, um, what we want you to do is focus on your community. And um, so you'll, you'll be studying there and then hopefully doing your clinicals there. Our two um, required on-site um, experiences happen, one at the very beginning of the program for an orientation session. And then the second one is um, a, a clinical skills intensive where you come onto campus and have a week long immersive experience in everything that we can teach you about how to use, um, apply your didactic knowledge in the clinical setting and most particularly emphasizing hand skills. So that's why you really need to be on campus. We have lots of amazing um, simulated uh, mannequins and stuff for learning birth management. And we also have standardized patients that give you the opportunity to practice um, in a very safe place ways to begin to apply the knowledge that you've learned in your academic courses. And um, feel free as we're chatting to ask questions as we go. You can um, be, you're very welcome to put questions in the chat box in Zoom, but you also can just raise your hand and ask. Either way is perfectly fine. So just interrupt me if you um, have questions as we're going along. Um, another thing that I think is really special about Frontier that I think um, offers a huge benefit to our um, students is that we have a really um, robust midwifery faculty and nurse practitioner faculty. We are the largest midwif nurse midwifery program in the country. Um, and so you really have a depth of faculty that is unequal anywhere else in a nurse midwifery education program in the U.S. And that just offers you a lot of experience. What I love is that so many of our students come in with, um, you know, they, you know, you want to be a nurse midwife, or you know, you want to be a women's health nurse practitioner, but you also have a very specific population that you would that you might be interested in dealing with. So maybe your passion is for folks that are um, experiencing issues around fertility, or maybe you are interested in caring for an LGBTQ community, or maybe your interest is in adolescent care. Whatever your interest is, um, we probably have a faculty member who has a lot of experience in that um, particular role as a midwife or as a WHNP. So I think that offers a really great benefit to our students, it really gives you the opportunity to get to um, really kind of begin some role development in directions that you want to go, which I think is really um, an exciting opportunity for our students. Um, we do have students in all 50 states, um, and we have alumni and graduates that are now not only in all 50 states, but in many countries around the world. So um, the amazing thing about Frontier is, even though we have a really fairly small little tiny campus in Versailles, Kentucky, we have a huge community that really spreads around the world. Um, we have currently um, graduated approaching 3,000 graduates at this time. I mean, currently enrolled, approaching almost 3,000 currently enrolled students. And as you can see, more than 8,000 graduates. So um, it's an exciting place to be if what you're thinking about is becoming a nurse midwife or a nurse practitioner. Uh, we've, Frontier's recently been um, recognized with quite a few different awards, but some that we're really um, proud of is um, one of the ones that I'm most excited about is the top call just by, for diversity, as you can see on the right. And then also this um, US Distance Learning Association. So the other thing you should know about Frontier is we're the oldest distance um, education program that's teaching nurse midwifery and nurse practitioners. So it's becoming, much more common, but we started doing distance education before the internet existed. So there was a time that we were doing it by mailing packets of information and packets of curriculum to our students and they would complete it and mail it back. So we can all be thankful. We can all take a moment to be thankful that we don't have to use that approach anymore. But my point is really that we've been doing distance education um, since the late eighties. And so we've, that's given us a lot of time to learn some really important lessons about how to do it well and how to make you feel really connected 
and part of a community because the idea of changing roles from that of a nurse to that of a nurse, advanced practice nurse can be a little overwhelming, but the idea of thinking about doing that in isolation, sitting at home by yourself can be terrifying. But I want you to know that that really is not the experience. The experience is even though you're at home doing your work in your community, um, I think you will vote. Um, our students really tell us over and over that they feel as connected or even more connected oftentimes than they did when, when they were attending a brick and mortar institution. And we're very um, intentional about that. We know that um, it's important for you to feel connected as you're learning and that it adds to a, a deeper level of learning and understanding. So we have a huge group of people that, are, that work with our students as they move through our curriculum. You've met a few of us tonight on the call. In addition to um, those, those of us that you've already heard from, and you'll hear more from us, um, we have regional clinical faculty that are nurse midwives or nurse practitioners that live all across the country, and they are assigned to students in their region to, um, as they're working through the clinical parts of the curriculum, and, and Dr. Freed will tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. We've got some amazing academic advisors who um, do uh, so much more than suggest what course you're going to take next. They are really a wonderful resource for um, study tips and tips for success. Um, so I think that's an amazing um, feature that we offer. And then our clinical advisors, as Katie mentioned, are a team of people who work alongside you as you're looking for clinical sites. They um, monitor our clinical, our community map, or they maintain it. And it currently, Katie, you can tell us the number of clinical sites on the community map. It's enormous. Yes, we have um, over 15,000 sites um, on currently on our community map. And um, I'm not exactly sure how many preceptors, but many more. And our credentialing department um, credentials new sites, you know, every day. So it's a great resource once you're a student here. And I, and we also know that that's one of the things that students come to us with a lot of anxiety about is how am I going to find a clinical site? Um, please know that you would have, that our students have a whole team of people working alongside them as they're looking for clinical sites. But it's a beautiful thing really because what you're doing is sort of guiding that effort because we want you to find sites in your community where you know you're going to end up living and being a part of the care of the, of the folks that you, um, that are there in your community. Um, excuse me just a minute. We also have, um, we have a lot of student mentoring groups. We have some, we have student interest groups that um, really are devised to meet some special needs of students in, in maybe niche populations. We've got a lot of financial aid off officers that work with our students. We have um, numerous scholarships. And we also have one of the most amazing libraries, which is a little bit um, surprising for a distance education program. If you went to campus and you walked in our physical library, you would be incredibly underwhelmed because there's a, I have more books on my bookshelf right here. But uh, from a digital standpoint, we have an amazing library and really phenomenal librarians that are readily available to help you find what you need. We also have a really diverse um, excuse me, a really robust diversity impact program that our diversity office holds a conference once a year that is um, held virtually at this time. It's been virtual. Who knows where that may go in the future? Um, that really helps us all as we try to move along our paths um, to an, on our anti-racist journeys that we're on. Um, so let me talk just a little bit more about student support. Let me make sure I only went, can I skip from, okay. Um, so scholarships, I know if you're thinking about going back to school, one of the very first things that comes to your mind is how am I going to pay for it? Um, so we, Frontier has a lot of um, scholarships that we manage internally. They do require, require you to make um, 24 hours worth of credit, uh, credit hour progress in the program. Um, but there are really quite a lot of scholarships available. We also help connect you. We also know of other scholarships that we don't maintain internally, but that we can um, help connect you with. Um, I am, I don't, 
do anything with financial aid or scholarships. That's not my purview. Um, but I do know that we have a lot of folks that can answer questions. So if you have concerns about financial parts of it, please do not let that be an obstacle for you. Um, we can certainly connect you very easily with folks that can help problem solve around that. Um, so Katie is one of our um, clinical outreach, works in our clinical outreach and placement uh, department. As she said, she's one of our clinical advisors. Katie, I'm just gonna let you take this slide and expound on it a little bit, if you will. Sure. Um so as Dr. Thrower mentioned, um, as a frontier student, you, um, you know, are basically, you, it's your responsibility to find your own clinical sites. We do not place you in clinical sites, um, which a lot of students like this because you can choose where you want to rotate. And um, so you can you could rotate in any of the 50 US states as long as you have a license in that state where you are rotating. Um, however, sometimes finding clinical sites can be a challenge for students, especially our students who live in rural areas. And so my unit was formed to help support students in that. Um, Think of different ways to market yourself um, to potential preceptors and sites. Um, look at our community map, dig through our community map and uh, find sites that maybe you didn't think about or you haven't contacted yet. And just different other ways to help support you in your clinical site search. Um, we typically work one-on-one -on -one with the students with, um, and then we also hold group advising sessions each term. Um, but we are basically a support system for the clinical site search. All right, thank you so much, Katie. Sorry about that. I <laughs> was struggling to unmute myself. Um, I, the, our clinical advisors really are an amazing um, part of our um, frontier community. And I think um, really provide a service that is, is helpful. So we appreciate everything you do. Um, so in addition to, so I'll just to tell you a little bit more about uh, myself really briefly, I'm a, so I am a nurse midwife. I've been a nurse midwife um, for quite a few decades now to a long, it's a number I'm trying to not keep up with so closely anymore. It's getting so big. Um, I am, so I'm the department chair. So ultimately I kind of supervise what's going on within the department, but my focus is more on the academic or didactic part of the program. And Dr. Freed, um, her then is our clinical director who is really more focused on everything clinical. So um, she and I are both readily available to students as you're moving through the program. But we also have, so if, the way it works at Frontier is a little different than some of the other um, advanced practice registered nurse programs in the country. We kind of um, have you do all of your academic courses first. So we front load all of that knowledge didactic content. And then, as I said earlier, you come on to, once you've completed all of those academic courses, you come onto campus for a week of that um, clinical skills intensive that we call clinical bound. Our orientation session is frontier bound. So you go to frontier bound first, then you do all of your academic courses come to clinical bound for one week. And then once you finish clinical bound, you go home and start in your clinical practicum in your um, community. So throughout all of your academic courses, you're gonna have a course coordinator in every course and, and almost every course has multiple course faculty. And the reason I think that is important is that some of our courses can get fairly large, but um, it's not gonna be that experience that some of you might've had as an undergrad where you're sitting in a huge auditorium with 300 students and there's some little person at the, you know, so far if you almost need binoculars to see them. Um, it's really quite different than that. Most of our coursework is done asynchronously, which means you can do it around your schedule, but all of our courses, um, in all of our courses, you would have a faculty member assigned to a much smaller group of people than the entire course. So you really have a lot of faculty interaction. And then once you get to that, 
clinical part of the program, um, you have your clinical faculty who is with you on throughout that part of the journey. So you've got a lot of folks moving along with you in the program. Again, we've talked about the academic advisors and clinical advisors, um, the financial and financial aid. Our credentialing coordinator, which uh, coordinators, which Katie mentioned, um, they pick up an, and do another really important service, which is once you have worked with your clinical advisor and your clinical faculty to find your clinical site and your preceptors, then we have a we have a, a unit that takes care of all the credentialing for you. So they get the contracts written up and they do all the legwork for all of the behind the scenes part of it, um, which is really awesome. So you don't really have to worry too much about that. But Dr. Freed may mention, uh, uh, address a little bit of that as we yeah, move forward. If you wanna just leave this slide up, I can take it from here unless there's more you wanted Thanks. to say right now. Nope, thank you. Okay, and Katie, are you the one advancing the slides? No, I am. Oh, okay, super. I'll just let you know when I'm ready. Um, I. Uh, Angelica, one of us will circle back and answer your question. Actually, I'll just answer it now because probably a lot of people have it. Um, yes, basically yes to everything you just said. Um, there have been many sort of lines in the sand about um, when you're going to need a DNP. Right now, there is no date to that. And I know some people on this call are interested in the Women's Health NP. Some are interested in nurse midwifery. The nurse midwifery professional organization differs a bit from the nurse practitioner professional organizations in not supporting the DNP as the entry to practice degree. And um, most simplistically, it's because of a couple things. There's a need for more clinicians and there's not really clear evidence that being a DMP improves outcomes in clinical care, but it does cost more and take people longer. At the same time, there are tons of benefits to getting the DNP. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in, we have a fairly fluid way for you to do that at Frontier. It's not like you just like need to graduate, go away, and then start all over from scratch and say, hmm, maybe I want to get a DMP. Like there is a, a process um, that you're welcome to ask about um, that we can talk to you about, but it's not a requirement. It's not something you should panic about. Like if you're comparing coming here to going somewhere that's a BSN to DNP, there's not a concern that at any point you wouldn't be able to practice without having earned the DNP. Does that answer your question, Angelica? And then while we give her a chance to respond, I also just wanted to say, um, super, okay. A very common question, I know it'll come up again. It comes up again at Frontier Bound and multiple other times throughout the program. Um, so I know that Dr. Thrower already went over this list of who's like on your team, but this is something else that remains confusing for a lot of people during the time they're at Frontier. So if you already are like, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm shutting down, I don't think I can listen to the rest of this, please just like unmute and ask your questions or go ahead and put them in the chat because like the last couple of slides are a lot. Um, and I want to make sure that you know, we're addressing what's on your mind right now before we just start throwing other things out there. Um, yeah, so I, I, I had, I came into this meeting with a few questions. Uh -huh. My name is Caitlin. Uh -huh. um, I am from New York and my yep. understanding is that you're only able to admit six students, um, upstate New York students. So I hopefully got that number correct. And I just didn't know um, if there's been progress in that regards or how you kind of divvy up you know, how many students? Is it just depending upon how many apply in a cycle or do you take like two, one cycle, two, another, two, another, um, and how that goes? So I can take that question, Caitlin, and you are exactly right. We are, um, the New York State Board of Education has allowed us to take six students from upstate New York per year, none from the city. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, more or less a first come first serve so once those six slots have been filled then we wouldn't be able to take any further students and this um for us to be able to take the six students is the is the is progress honestly because at first it was zero yeah. and um i don't anticipate that change there's there's been no movement on that um despite our best efforts to um, 
you know, to continue to try to work on it. But I'm going to tell you, I feel quite, I, I, we feel honored that we can have six students here because most of the midwifery education programs in the country, um, if they're not in New York, they, they don't even have the option to do six. So we think it's better than zero, but I wish it was way more. So. Yeah. And I mean, I've been in communication with the New York State Education yeah. Department and have uh, made my opinion quite clear. Well, and we appreciate <laughs> that because that probably means more coming from you really than it does from us. Yeah. Um, but so do you just basically give a like notification, like, you know, that there are no other, like, say I plan to apply in July for the October start. Um, is it that, you know, you just kind yeah. of like, yeah. Do we know it if was, they've already been taken, et cetera? That's <laughs> such a great question. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat box and I would really encourage anybody that lives in New York to mm -hmm. reach out to me before you go through the application process, because I don't, okay. you know, to be honest with you, if you were to apply, for instance, for a fall start, and mm -hmm. we couldn't accept you because we already had our six, you can defer your enrollment by one term. So you may be able to okay. roll that over to winter. But if you applied for like spring, and we'd already gotten our six, you'd have to reapply all over again, because you can only defer for one term. So just, okay. I, I'd rather you talk to me before and let me get you some background information on where we are in any admission year on that before you go too far down. I don't want you to waste your time. So I'll put my chat, my email address in the chat box for you. Okay, wonderful. And Angela, if you're one of those six students who do still find your own site, um, the, the State Board of Education in New York does not dictate that. So it does still sort of work out the same. Okay. I'm answering a question in the chat real quick and then I'll take over with the next slide. Are you gonna, are you typing it or do you just wanna say it? There's so many in there right now that I'm gonna type one. Feel free to verbally okay. respond to other ones. I'm responding to Henry. And I will tell you that Kumba, you're, if you, so, Practicing midwives in other countries, um, in order to become certified nurse midwives in the U.S., you must first be, take the NCLEX exam and become a registered nurse in this country, and then you can move forward to considering application here. But that for folks that are coming from out of the country, that's oftentimes the issue is that um, you've got to you have to be an RN in this country first, so you have to. Have taken the NCLEX in the United States. Um, and we don't have a bridge. Um, so a bridge program from master's to a DNP, um, you would complete our, you would complete our master's first, and then you can keep going to get the doctorate. Um, and it is a, a kind of a streamlined approach versus somebody who say has, is already at WHMP and wants to just come in and do the DNP. Um, but you can always stop out at the master's level and practice um, if that's if you would so choose. Is there a staff person on the call who can respond to some of the financial aid questions in the chat? And then I'll move forward on the, the slide deck. We'll um, keep working on them behind the scenes. Yeah, and, and then a couple even. people... I'll, I'll answer one other one and then move forward, but I, I know that I don't actually know the answers to the financial aid questions. I want to make sure those don't get lost. Um, but I saw at least two people talked about the experience requirement for the nurse midwifery program um, to apply. Um, so it does say, uh, I believe, um, in the process that you have to have one year experience in an RN capacity. That does not need to be in a labor and birth RN capacity. There are pros and cons to having it be in a labor and birth capacity. Um, and then I see somebody else is asking about having been a doula or a midwife assistant. Um, anywhere that there's a gray area, if, if one of the people in admissions isn't able to answer that question, they'll circle back to Dr. Thrower or me um, so that we can get you an answer. So we always, it's always a good idea to ask, like, does this experience count or some of the things are really um, individual, which is why we're always happy to talk with people. Um, for example, um, just depending on the geographic area that you're in, you may feel more or less prepared to go to clinical or to go into practice given your past experience. So part of it is, 
you know, sort of what are the rules of getting in the program. Um, but part of it is, and some of you are asking this, which is why I'm responding to it. What are the things that can set you up for success in terms of finding a placement and finding a job, depending on where you want to live and be situated? So again, if, um, you know, just keep asking until you get to the right person for those kind of individual questions. And Dr. Thrower, I know you're trying to answer in the chat, but could you also advance the slide for me? <laughs> okay. So, um, there was actually just a blog post about my journey today, um, and it looks very much like this, if, if not even more interesting than that. So a lot of you are already anticipating the universe's plans for you and asking some of those relevant questions in the chat. So just we know that this is how life goes um, because this is how life goes. This is why a lot of people choose Frontier because they don't know what their work hours are going to be or if they're going to have a baby while they're in the program or if they're going to move to another state. Um, and so that is a, one of the reasons a lot of people come here. And so we are very used to being, um, there's a fancy corporate word for that now, nimble. I just remembered what it was uh, about working with students um, because of all these sort of different things that come at you. Next slide, please. Okay, um, oops, if we can go back one, thank you. So we have various options here um, that we've talked about a bit. I'll circle back to the one we haven't mentioned yet. So I'm gonna go a little bit out of order. There's the master's degree, which probably the majority of you are here to think about. Um, like I alluded to earlier in our session tonight, if you know you wanna do the DNP from the outset, or if at some point during your master's, you're like, hey, I wanna do the DNP. There's a fluid way to transition to that. Um, so that it is part of your overall experience, um, rather than like you do, it's not just one thing. It's not a BSN to DNP program. Um, but you also don't need to like complete the MSN and then come back and think like, oh, I think I want to apply for the DNP. I wonder if I'm going to be accepted. Um, there's more fluidity to it than that. And then the one that we have not talked about yet is the postgraduate certificate. So some of you might be on this call, um, and thinking, oh, I'm already a family nurse practitioner or I'm already a women's health nurse practitioner or whatever it is. And I want to get a second credential as a nurse midwife or a women's health nurse practitioner. So those are the three kinds of programs that we have. Um, I'm going to pause questions about those degree options before I move on to the time frame situation. Okay. Um, keep those coming if you do have them. So then sort of how long does all this take? What am I doing? Um, so it's basically what for some of you, when you did your undergrad was on a quarter system. Ours is kind of like that. There's four terms per year. Each one is 11 weeks. Um, and students have a two week break between terms. Um, there's certainly, like we were saying, where there's a lot of malleability. Um, there are rules about how much time you can take off. It is four terms a year. It's There's not an assumption that you're going to take summers off or anything like that. And things happen where sometimes you do need to take a break. And there's lots of ways that we can navigate around that, whether you anticipate it or you don't anticipate it. Um, given that time frame, a straight up master's um, takes about two to three years, the postgraduate certificate, one to one and a half years, and the DNP 18 months. And of course, that variability um, has a lot to do with how high volume your clinical site is and how available you are in terms of working and other responsibilities. Next slide, please. So a lot of you are asking questions about the admissions criteria. So I'll just highlight some things here because obviously you can read it. So for this program, you already need to be an RN. There are other um, programs that don't require that. And you do need, but one place where we have a, you don't have to have a BSN to apply, but you have to have a bachelor's and an RN. So if you have a, a BSN, super, that counts. But if you have a bachelor's in you know, English literature and then you got an associate's RN, also counts. Um, so you just need to have those two things, whether they're from one degree or two separate degrees. Um, you can see what the GPA requirements are. You need to have that one year of RN experience, as I discussed. 
We do require COVID-19 vaccination for a variety of reasons. Um, we have a requirement that students come to campus and our campus requires vaccination. Also finding a site to do your clinicals is uh, extremely challenging to say the least if you're not vaccinated. And then we already talked a bit about the limitations um, for New York State. Um, right now, Raven, um, the requirement is that you have the initial full vaccination set, but no boosters. So I think depending on if you have the J and J, it's the one and the others is two. Uh, but nobody's nobody's chasing numbers of boosters as they come out at this moment. Um, PGC, you can see um, largely the same criteria, um, but you have to already have a master's or another degree. Um, that made you an advanced practice nurse already. So yeah, when we're talking about the postgraduate certificate, um, that's for students who already are an advanced practice registered nurse in a different specialty. Um, and just to circle back, Angela, if you popped on later, um, upstate six, but downstate as in the city, zero, unfortunately. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Thrower started out a little bit talking about, um, the mission statement of, um, Frontier. And a lot of that is about serving the underserved and rural populations. And in addition though, just being an exceptional clinician, um, obviously as part of our mission. And so there's just so many people here, both faculty and students. Well, I said both, but now I'm going to say three things, um, faculty, students, and staff with a variety of lived experiences and professional experiences. And so that's exciting to be part of a community. I will also add that the part of a community is largely what you make it. Um, a lot of students are nervous that they won't have as much community um, as they might if they went to a brick and mortar school. And I would just say the more you reach out to your faculty and fellow students, you 100% have that community. But if you're also like, I just want to do this work on my own time and I don't really people, want people to talk to me, you can create that kind of environment for yourself and you can be successful. So it's not, I don't want you to think like, I have to be super extroverted to survive in an online learning environment. It can work for a lot of different kinds of learners. Next slide, please. Oh, is that it? Are we on the Q&A? Oh, no. Okay. It said Q&A at the top. Um, okay. I think somebody other than me is taking over here. Is that right? I'm sorry. I was trying to do about 10 different things at once. Of there. course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll take over one. I'll, yeah, I can pick back up here and say that, as you can see, um, there are, here are some upcoming deadlines for applying. So if you are interested in starting in the summer, that deadline application is April 5th. So you still have time to get that together. If you would be interested more in starting in the fall, then you have you can wait all the way out until June 28th. And again, as I mentioned, if you would, if you apply for a particular term and then something comes up and you need to um, delay enrolling, you can do that for one term as it goes, okay? Um, in terms of application steps, there, the application is online. You can find that um, on, on the portal at frontier.edu. Uh, it does require a couple of uh, short essays. You have to include your uh, updated resume, um, transcripts from your prior education programs, and um, we do accept students who are um, nurses that have a bachelor's degree in something else, but have an, an associate degree in nursing. For those applicants, it requires a, a little bit of a different application process that consists of a, answering a portfolio of questions, which is you know, it's a, 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 some additional short answer um, questions. None of them are, um, they don't require you to you know, write multiple, multiple pages. Um, more like paragraphs. Um, you can also see at the bottom our current um, cost per credit hour. And so another thing that's uh, exciting to me is it ends up being one of the more cost-effective programs in the country. That's also one of the things that we really strive to do. 
And I'll take the next slide back. Thank yes, you. There you go. Um, thanks for that. And I, I didn't get very far in the chat, but we'll do it. We'll get it to everybody before we're done. Um, okay. So then back to your clinical experiences, um, you can see here for master's students, it's a total of 675 clinical hours. Nobody should get attached to the 16 weeks number. Um, I have an example for students who do choose to enroll and then are questioning how to set up their clinical time. I have a sample calendar of somebody who did it in 16 weeks. That's like for somebody that is not working for pay, has very little family responsibilities and has a very um, high volume site that they can meet all of their hours, all of their visit types and all of their learning needs in that period of time. So nobody should kind of fixate on that number for 16 weeks, but um, it can certainly take up to three semesters for people to complete it. Again, based on the other things you have going on in your life and how busy your site is. Um, for PGC, you can see you need a total of 540 clinical hours. Um, again, sometimes PGC is a little bit more challenging because if you're working a Monday through Friday um, APRN job, that's different than like, oh, I'm working two weekend days as an RN. So again, just expect to need to be very flexible and do a lot of forward planning um, for those hours. And then you can see the DNP requirement. Midwifery is a little bit um, different than some of the nurse practitioner specialties. This is a little bit confusing and not super relevant for all of you right now, but nurse midwifery and nurse practitioner are both advanced practice registered nurses, but a nurse midwife is not a kind of nurse practitioner. They're a kind of advanced practice nurse. So now that you've ingested that alphabet soup, let me circle back to midwifery has a couple little things specific to it. One being that it's competency-based. Um, this is throughout the US, neither of these things is specific to Frontier, but it just means that in addition to getting a certain number of hours and certain numbers of specific visit types, so so many births, so many anapartum, so many gynecologic visits, that type of thing, you also need to demonstrate competency in those skills. Now we've built the program so that for by far the majority of students, the hours and the visit types align with the student achieving competency. Um, but if those don't align, you know, if you, you got your 200 antepartum visits, but you're not demonstrating competency, then it is possible you'll need more visits. There are also many, many checkpoints throughout the program to get you to competency in alignment with your hours and visit types. So um, it occurs to me that we could have put a separate slide in here, or maybe it's the next one, and I'm just not looking ahead, about um, the WHNP role. A lot of people on this call tend to be kind of toggling back and forth between the two roles or thinking about getting both um, or have questions about why would I get both? Why would I not get both? So this is a good time to ask some of those questions that you have. So... In terms of New York, I'm going to tell you that they don't really allow a lot of exceptions. If you register, if you apply to our program using a New York home address, you are going to be in that pool of candidates trying to get into six slots per year that we have. Um, now, if you live on the border and you almost know that you won't do your clinicals, I mean, you know you do your clinicals in Connecticut or something like that. We still can't accept you if you are going to enroll with a New York address. But that's all. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that one. <laughs> there may be a little wiggle room in there if you, um, you know what I'm saying. But we can. This is really that New York wants to um, support its own education programs, and I and I get that. So they. This is why they've played the, placed these um, requirements on us, and we. It, this is, we would like to have 600 students in New York, right? Um, it, this is not something that we, um, this is something that we comply with because that's what we are asked to do. Um, okay. What other questions? Is there anything that, if you put something in the chat box and we missed it? Yeah, I'm going to respond to Caitlin's message. And then, um, yeah, like Dr. Thrower said, then if you, if we have not responded to you yet, if you can just um, paste it back in there, we'll get to you. 
So Caitlin says, I've been told that eight births must be in the hospital, but the other 32 can be out of hospital. Can this be confirmed? It is true that eight of your births must occur in the hospital, eight of the births that you have as part of your clinical experience. The other 32 can be out of hospital. They don't have to be out of hospital. There are some significant parameters around um, out of hospital sites. Um, the other thing I would say is just, again, before you really have your mind made up, like this is 100% what I want to do for my clinical site, you're going to want to have many touch points throughout the program where you meet with various people on the, on the team to support you to talk about um, what is the volume of those sites and is it realistic for you to get that volume and also what are your practice goals. Um, for example, if you're somebody who wants to be, and like many of you, somebody else wants my attention right now. Um, but if you're somebody that is like, you plan to practice in an out of hospital setting, that makes sense to be trained in that setting. Um, but if you're in a state, in a geographic location where realistically, you're probably going to practice in the hospital, you're going to want to have marketable skills on graduation. So those things can be individualized. And we do a lot of working with you individually about your needs when we help you to put together your clinical plan. Um, I'm going to answer Morgan's next. If someone wanted to be a CNM and women's primary care, do you suggest doing the CNM and the postgraduate certificate for women's primary care? So I think the question is really to clarify what does women's primary care mean? If you are like, I want to do um, I want to manage chronic hypertension and diabetes and ear infections and toenail fungus, then you want to be a CNM and an FNP. Um, but if you want to be the person that um, adult people who identify as female come to see once a year and you say, hey, I got you know, let's get your PAP on schedule and get your mammogram ordered if it's age appropriate and talk about sexual health and contraception. And by the way, you also should be thinking about colonoscopy and updating your vaccines. You could do that as a nurse midwife. Um, you don't, and, and we do say that midwifery is a primary care provider in the sense that you can be the touch point for um, people who identify as female really throughout their lifespan from like the time of menarche for the rest of their life. Um, they will likely need another clinician at some point for some types of care. Um, Morgan, will you just indicate if that's an adequate answer to your question? Okay, that's helpful. And then we have one person with their hand raised. Okay. Yes, Fatty. Do you want to just uh, turn? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, um, I, I've already asked this question, but I didn't get it. So I just want it to be reiterated. Um, I live, I currently live in the United Kingdom. I am a um, practicing midwife, um, qualified. I also have a master's degree in human rights law. Um, I'm looking to move in the United, um, I mean, the US. And I'm, I'm looking to... To, to get enrolled on your North Midwifery um, program. I'm just trying to to know how, because I've been going around in circles, trying yeah. to know how to, 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 to go about it. Okay. So to be certified as a nurse midwife, so to become a certified nurse midwife in the U.S., you have to um, be a registered nurse in the U.S., which means you have to take the NCLEX exam which is what our undergraduate nursing students would take when they graduate. Um, okay. And then once you've done that, you could um, apply to Frontier. You would not need to have a year's nursing experience within the U.S. If you're practicing a midwife, if you are a practicing midwife in the U.K., you would have already fulfilled your requirement for experience that Frontier has set. But um, in order to become a CNM in, in, the, in the U.S., you have to take the boards that are administered by the American Midwifery Certification Board, and they require that you are an RN to begin with to become a, a certified nurse midwife. Okay. There are a couple of, there are a few country, uh, well, excuse me, programs in the U.S. that don't require you to become a nurse first, mm -hmm. um, and then you would graduate as a certified midwife. Okay. Um, I know that Yale offers that, Pitt, the University of Pennsylvania, or the Jefferson, Jefferson University offers it. That okay. um, certification is not um, recognized in all states. It's only recognized in a few states, but it is an option. 
Okay. Okay. Does that did that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. What about um, the sorry? What about ahead. the NCLEX? How do I go about the NCLEX? Um, that is actually a question that I am not really very well prepared to answer. Um, Okay. Eva, did you want to speak to that? No, I think that's something that, I mean, we can certainly support you in locating that information, but I think that's more in like the Google search territory. Um, and I hate to sort of punt you back to there because we want to support you. So you have our contact information. If you're not able to find that, you can certainly follow up with us and we can help. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And then there was a question in the chat from someone on their phone that says, my goal is to DMP and WHMP and CNM certification. Can you have an idea of how long that would take? Um, so you cannot do the CNM and the WHMP concurrently as it exists today. We are actually um, exploring the option of making that available, but right now it is not. So the, the most streamlined way to do it right now would be to do the midwifery education program, which um, as Eva said, takes about two and a half years. Then you could do the postgraduate certificate for the WHMP, which would add um, probably six to nine months, mostly more clinical experience, maybe um, a didactic course, but not very many. Um, and then the DMP after that takes about a year and a half. So if you wanted to do all of those things, you're looking at probably five years, I would say, just as a rough estimate. I wanted to send that to you, Dr. Thrower, because you can sometimes be more creative about the timeline than I can. Yeah, and we would we certainly like to give people credit, as much possible credit as we can for things they already know and have already done. So anytime you're thinking about coming back to add a postgraduate certificate, we would want to do that and really work with you to, to determine what classes you have really already satisfied in previous academic work, and then really just make a, an individualized program of study. Then Eva, do you want to take this one? What does the level of involvement look like for clinicals or does it depend on the yep. site preceptor? Yeah, we've gone back and forth on that one. Okay, um, okay. And I think to the asker's satisfaction, okay. but yeah, hundred percent in case other people were wondering not, um, that's not a shadowing experience. We, that's what I'm talking about, about um, demonstrating competence. So when you graduate, you should be a safe entry-level clinician. Um, and so you have a close relationship with somebody in a position called your regional clinical faculty who is monitoring that you are um, allowed the kind of experiences that can help you reach that goal um, in an appropriate time frame based on you know your learning and your needs. Um, Nicole's and question. then I'm gonna. Are you okay if I just jump to the the last question and then I'll sure. pause it? Okay. Yep. So 675 hours in 16 weeks. Um, so. Um, I'm not doing the math right this second, but no, it's not 42. It's actually more in the neighborhood of 30 hours a week. Um, and maybe that seems numerically impossible, but it's made sense to me before. Um, <laughs> so I'll do the math real quick while Dr. Thrower answers more questions. But yeah, it's in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 hours per week of clinical. And we accept about 110 to 120 midwifery students per term and about 40 to 50 women's health students per term. Um, I'm gonna look. I'll take Jessica's next question sure, go um, ahead. while I also do 675 divided by 16. Yeah, that does come out to 42. Okay, back to the drawing board, but nobody does it in 16 weeks anyway. So just pretend I ever said that. Um, no, I'll, I'm actually, I'm being kind of silly, but I will circle back and say, based on our expectations around your sleep and rest and the other coursework that you need to do, it's really unrealistic to, to get done that quickly. Um, but we can always, we can collaborate from the very beginning, from the minute you enroll. What is this going to look like for me? You know, what are my options so that you have a realistic expectation going forward? Um, and then to Jessica's question here, um, and no, it's not, this isn't on the website. Um, the timeline for finding a clinical site, it's just so variable. We have people come into the program who are like, the reason I'm coming to this program is because so-and-so, you know, knows me as a nurse and encouraged me to do it and said, they're going to take me at their clinical site. And on day one, sorry, my dog is moving furniture on day one, they know where they're going to go. And then they just follow the process to put in the forms. 
Um, whereas other students may live in an area where it's more difficult to obtain a site, or they may have limitations based on their, you know, their job or their family responsibilities. And it takes them a lot longer to find an appropriate site. So there's not a rule, Jessica. It just may mean a delay if you relocate. The other thing is um, you do need to have an RN license in the state where you do clinicals. So sometimes that causes a delay. But again, from day one, you just tell the people on your team, this is my situation and we'll work with you individually. Um, um, real quick, and then I know I said I'd be quiet, but real quick, no, it's okay. I, just faster than I can find it. Um, if one of the other faculty or staff on the call knows how to uh, show students uh, an example program, a study for a full-time or part-time option, that's a question I'm seeing in the chat. Okay, and I can do that. I'll take this question from Sarah. Does being an FNP have any bearing on who you're allowed to, patients you're allowed to manage during um, intrapartum care? The, the short answer is no. Um, it's going to kind of depend on your particular site and preceptor where you're doing your clinicals, but our students um, will work alongside their preceptor. So any, basically any, any patient that your preceptor was um, caring for, you would also be caring for. Um, uh, Caitlin, thanks for some clarification. It is um, Jefferson is the one in Pennsylvania. Uh, Yale at one time did offer the CM if they've stopped. I wasn't aware of that. And SUNY Downstate, yes. Um, program of study, did anybody get that or am I still trying to go? Thank you, Quincy. Uh, I didn't even know you were with us. All right, we are just about out of time. I really want to appreciate everybody. Um, statistics requirement for, appli for application. Um, I do think you... Do we have an admissions officer? I think we have to have an admission, a statistics course, but I can't remember off the top of my head, but your admissions counselors can really help you with those. Oh, you want, uh, Quincy, can you get Jesse the PGC? Okay, perfect, thank you. All right, well, thank you all so much for attending um, tonight. It was great to see everybody. We hope we see you again. Um, feel free to reach out to either myself or to Dr. Freed. Um, it's just eileen.thrower at frontier.edu or eva.freed at frontier.edu. And we're very it's happy. Eva.freed01. Oh, oh thank you, Eva. Edu. I'm sorry. Because not only am I number one, but I was a student here. So that's how I got the number. And but yeah, you can tell we're both super enthusiastic. So totally, um, please reach out to us. We love to talk about this again. Like I said, and we didn't really dig into it. A lot of students have questions like, do I want to do the WHMP? Do I want to do midwifery? Happy, happy to answer anything. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to chat via email or in person. So anytime you have more questions, feel free to reach out and thank you all. We hope to see many of you again.